that simple?
And my story isn't over My story's just begun And here you want to find me Cause that's what the father does Yeah, here you want to find me Cause that's what the father does Ooh, lay your burden
this next song. Uh, it's a song written by one of our own people here. So Mariah has been asking me to play this song for like a month. She's like, when are we going to sing this song? When are we gonna sing this? So this is a song that Mariah actually wrote the words to. One of our young people. And uh, um, I challenged her. I said, hey, you write the, you write the words and I'll, I'll write some music to it. So we collaborated. Isn't that right? So uh, this is a song by Mariah Miller and myself. And it's called Chains Are Broken. Yes? <laughs> Here we go.
know what time it is. It's time to bless our children. And for this very reason, I mean, here's a child writing a song. And we cannot afford to look on their youth and just say that is a stumbling block. No, we need to encourage them and bless them to do greater things that we have done. So at this time, we're going to ask for the young people to come down. We're going to bless you. Speak a blessing over you. We have that power to do that through the spoken word and through the song. So if you want to come, come on down. If you're an adult, you want to come down with your child. As we sing the Sabbath prayer. May the Lord. May the Lord protect and defend you. May he always shield you from shame. May you come to be in Israel a shining. Like Ruth and like Ephraim, may you be deserving of praise. Strengthen them, O oh Lord, and keep them from the stranger's way. May God bless you. May God bless you and grant you. children this morning. So long. Bless our children. Got a, I've got an interesting message today. Um, I, I, I had a trouble. I had, I had, can I just confess? I had trouble writing this, this message. I was up late last night and then early this morning trying to finish something. My, my thoughts were just all over the place. But let me start with this. Uh, Many of us in this movement, in this walk, we've come out of various backgrounds. How many of you come, have come out of a Catholic background? Just a show of hands. How many of you come out of? Uh, huh? How many of you came out of a Christian background? Various denominations. Huh? Well, 
not supposed to be. Uh, <laughs> so out of the Christians, just call out. Protestant denomination. Protestant, okay. <laughs> See, this is where we're going to get in trouble right now. I can see already. So as far as the different denominations, um, United Methodist. United Methodist. Yeah. Wait a minute, one at a time, one at a time. Yeah. United Methodist, who else? Wesleyan. 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 That's what I just said. Wesleyan. Yes? We've got like Pentecostal, Methodist, Baptist, missionaries. We've been all over the place. <laughs> wow. Wow. Mennonite. Mennonite. Mennonite in the house, okay. <laughs> Who else? Who else? Presbyterian half Catholic. <laughs> oh my, you're proving my point. <laughs> Presbyterian half Catholic. German Baptist, you didn't say anything. I know you, you people back there, you German Baptist. I love the German Baptists, all two of them. So, anybody else? Brethren. Brethren. Uh huh. Lutheran, Lutheran yeah. So my point is, we come from a very um, mixed background, right? Um, out of all those groups that you named, none of them were in existence when the Lord walked the earth. Can I just tell you that? So what happened? People, people, division, yeah. So I'm going to just kind of kind of go back, because every time we talk, I hear people will, will say something. Before they say something, they go, well, you know, I'm a Christian, or, uh, you know, I came out of this to, to preface their stance. And really, I want to just kind of go back and show you from the beginning what our beginning should have been. How's that? Yes? And I, I don't have time to go through the whole thing, but I'm going to just take you from the beginning to where we are in a very short period of time. But I want to also um, kind of still say on the subject from last week, I want to talk to you about what the church is supposed to be. And, and actually, that word church is not really used in the Hebrew text. Did you know that? That's a newer word. The, the word if in Hebrew, it would be kahal. And it means called out assembly. And there is something called the law of first mention. In the Bible, when you see a word that is the first time it's mentioned, you need to use that as your proof text, as your, you know, when you go to Strong's, you need to go to the first place it's seen because a lot of times from that time on, it, it can change. The, 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 uh, the, the word itself can be used differently. And so I'm I got a lot of stuff on my mind, but I'm going to try to stay on, stay focused. But here we go. From Genesis until now. So here's, I'm going to start with a test. Can I do that? And, then, and I'm going to grade you. So you Presbyterian, German Baptist, whatever. anyway, when were the first known Torah commands originally given? In the Bible. In the Torah. How's that? In the Torah. In the God. How many people say the garden? Can I get it? Okay. Well, you're wrong. I'm just joking. I'm just, just, uh, I'm just joking. You're right. That's right. That's right. So in the Garden of Eden, when Yahweh told Adam, and eh, her name is not Eve, it's Chava, to refrain from eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, that was God giving his teaching and instruction. That's what Torah is, God's teaching and instruction. A loving God giving his people teaching and instruction. That's all it is. You parents, you know about this. You tell your child, don't cross the street in the middle, in the middle. You know, you, you tell them, look both ways, right? You, you give them instruction so that they would live, right? Yes? yes? Yes. Okay. That was a good one. So when was the first known sin sacrifice performed? Ooh. How many people say in the garden again? You want to phone a friend? Everybody believes it's in the garden again. The first sin sacrifice. <laughs> well, correct. I should have a little buzzer up here. So the first known sacrifice was when Yahweh killed an animal in the Garden of Eden to cover the sin of Adam and Chava. That's the first place it's seen. This is Torah. You got to start asking yourself right now, when did these people learn Torah? That wasn't the question. That's a rhetorical question. I'm just saying, 
if the Torah hadn't been given yet, how did they learn? How did they get a hold of this information? How did they learn the commands? Well, I'll answer that question before you do. The Messiah was coming down. God was coming down in the cool of the day, and he was teaching them. This is before the earth was all, you know, was fully populated, and the Lord was able to come down, and he was teaching them Torah. But let's keep going with this. How do we know Cain and Abel were Torah observant? I'm going to assume that you know that they were, and I'm, I'm assuming, I'm making the assumption that they are or were Torah observant. How do you know? Both of those are good. Good answers. Good answer. They offered sacrifices to Yahweh. How did they know to offer sacrifice? And like you said, righteous sacrifice. You know, and, and Abel knew how to give the right sacrifice. Cain knew, but he didn't. So they had knowledge. Somebody was teaching these people. How do we know Noah was Torah observant? This is a harder one. Huh? How many? How many? How many? Seven pairs of clean animals. I always, you know, I went to a summer camp, a church summer camp. We had, well, I learned this song. It was like, the animals, they came, they came by twosies, twosies. That's not true. That's not right. They came by seven pairs of, of twos, you know, the clean animals. Now, the unclean animals came by twosie twosies, but not the clean animals. So, Yes. Because he knew the difference between clean and unclean animals. He knew back then that there was a difference between clean and unclean. He knew Torah. All right. Were any of the following, for $200, were any of the following Jews? No. Come on, i got to ask the question. I didn't even finish it. Adam, Eve, Cain, Abel, Noah. Hey, you guys have been listening. All right. I'm out there. All right. All right. <laughs> there were no Jews. And we, so we throw this term around. We throw this word Jews. Everybody in Israel is a Jew. No, they're not. Jews came from the lineage of Yaakov, which we, in English, we say Jacob. But he was the son of, well, I'm sorry, Je well, it's, I want to say Yehuda which is Judah, which is the son of, uh, the grandson of Abraham. By the way, speaking of Abraham, was Abraham a Jew? No, you better think about this. He's the father of the Jews. You do realize that. Okay, let me try this again. Look, look. Abraham was the father. He's called the father of the Jews. So I'm asking a simple question. For $300, was Abraham... Jewish. Somebody's been drinking that communion wine. If you don't think Abraham is Jewish, isn't Abraham Jewish? No. Okay, you say no. Okay, look here. I went to Wikipedia, which is an official, you know, information site, and it says here, in Jewish tradition, Abraham is called Abraham Avinu. Signifying that he's both the biological progenitor of the Jews and the father of Judaism, the first Jew. That's what Wikipedia says, and that's wrong. He was not a Jew. He was the first Hebrew. This guy was living in Iraq, and the Lord called to him, and his father was not a, mm, he wasn't walking in Torah. And he called to Abraham and said, leave your father's house and go into a land where I will show you. And when he crossed over the Jordan, that is called crossing over or being a Hebrew when he came into the promised land. So he was not a Jew. Uh, is anybody having a problem with this? You guys have been here too long now. <laughs> Most people would have a problem with this. This, this. this would be new news. All right, so this is where I'm starting. And this is not an official a definition of Messianic Judaism, but um, the, the Messiah, when he came 2,000 years ago, during that time, there wasn't any Christianity. There wasn't any de of these denominations. There was different sects of Judaism, though, of which Yeshua was a rabbi. 
But he taught a different, well, I shouldn't say different. He taught the correct form of Judaism, which was found in Torah, which he gave from the very beginning. So Messianic Judaism is a belief based on the idea that the Bible is one. I know if you've come out of a Christian background, you were told that there's an Old Testament and a New Testament, and the Old has become old, and the New has become new, and, and when the grace were no longer under the law, that was done, that was a, 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 that was a doctrine that was, the credit was given to Marcion, who said that, you know, there was a God in the Old Testament, and he was mean, he was killing people, and, but the God in the New Testament, well, he was a nice guy, he had sheep, and he put them on his shoulders, and he carried them around and talked to them and sing to them, he was a nice guy, he's a God of love. There are not two different testaments. There's one testament of the Messiah, of the God of Israel. One testament, not two. So this is a, a lady named Carmen Wecker, and she wrote a book called Should Christians, Observe, Should Christians Be Torah Observant? And this is what, one of the quotes that she had in her book. She said, the, a belief based on the idea that the Bible is one continuous God-breathed entity as opposed to two separate testaments whereas one supersedes the other. That's not how the Bible should be read. Uh, yeah. I showed this before, but in, on a Christianity st statistics article updated March 2017, it states that there were approximately, at that time, 41,000 of you people couldn't agree. So you had to make up your own denomination and your own little thing. And so 41,000 41, can you say that with me? 41,000 denominations or variations of those denominations. Of which none of those were in existence when the Lord walked the earth. I put this up here because many of you may not know this, but the Messianic movement, uh, there are two main, I'll, I'm going to say, I'm going to claim two main organizations that are, well, three Jews for Jesus also. But you have the Messianic Jewish Alliance of America, the MJAA, that's still very much in play. And the last one, Union of Messianic Jewish Congregations, it's the UMJC. Those two are two governing Messianic, Jewish Messianic um, organizations. And then you have Jews for Jesus out of Chicago as well. And so... Um, well, the one I was dealing with was in Chicago. So these are some groups that, um, that started in the, in, in the United States and have been flourishing. These groups are, are still going. Um, but I just wanted you to know who they are if you have not heard of these groups. All right. Here we go. You ready for this? Because, again... Last week, I was talking about what church is supposed to be. And many of you coming out of these different denominations, you probably have had some varying mm, traditions thrown at you. And, and many of these traditions are not to be found in Torah. They're not in our Bibles. Um, I was in a couple of black congregations, and there were certain rules you had to, you had to, you had to observe. Um, when I, I was living in Texas for a hot minute, and my wife and I wanted to try this exciting, we heard about this exciting black church, we were going to go, we were, let's go. So we went, my wife put on a, a sundress, if, you, if anybody's from the south, you know about something called a sundress, it's just a casual dress, and, um, and I had, you know, I was looking good, and, and we, we walked into this church, <laughs> we walked up to the church, and there was a, there <laughs> There was this woman there, and uh, she, she was probably, uh, probably from the Marines at some point in her, in her background. <laughs> and she looked at us, and we walked up the steps, and we were all excited about it, because we heard great things about this church. And we walked up, and, she, and the woman said, are you planning on coming in here today? And I said, well, yes, we are. We're here. We're on time. We're ready. She goes, You're, she pointed to my wife and said, well, she can't come in. I was like, excuse me? And, and she said, well, she didn't have stockings on. 
Well, I was like, wait a minute. How, first of all, how can you tell she didn't have stockings? Because usually some stockings, they're very sheer. But she knew my wife didn't have stockings on, and that pre prohibited us from coming into service that day. And so I, 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 I thought about making a scene, and I thought, no, that's not the proper thing to do. I said, well, thank you for pointing that out, and you've helped me make a decision today. And so we never darkened that door again. I don't know what kind of experiences you've had in different churches. Um, there are different traditions in different denominations. Um, one of the funniest things that happened, my brother, no, my son and I, we went to go visit my dad down in South Carolina. And my dad was attending, of all things, a Lutheran church. And they were having a communion service. And I did not know their tradition. So they made us come down to the altar, and they had this chalice. And they gave us, you know, these wafers, you know. And um, so we got this wafer. I didn't know what to do with it either. So, you know, we got this wafer, and they bring in this chalice. And so <laughs> my son was sitting to here, so they came to him first. And my son, God bless him, he didn't know what to do with the wafer. So when they brought the chalice, he dipped it into the water. <laughs> And the lady's face, just the expression on her face, was like, oh, you know, he did something mortal. It was some mortal sin that he that he had committed by doing that. Obviously, we were we were new to that tradition. Uh, you probably have some great traditions from your church, but many of these things were not included in the Bible. They're just not. And 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 can I just be a take a broad stroke and just say, Easter is not a tradition in the church, in the assembly. Christmas was not something that the early church would have celebrated. I know you don't want to hear that. Uh, Mother's Day, it's coming up, isn't it? That's not something that uh, is, is in Torah. Father's Day should be, but it's not either. Uh, uh, Valentine's Day, all of these traditions that we, in our culture, we celebrate, these are not the feast days of the Lord. But when I was growing up, we sure did pay more attention to those than the feast days of Yahweh. We didn't even know about, you know, Hagamatza. We, we didn't know. We didn't know about Sukkot. We didn't know about um, Habikarim. We, we did not celebrate those things, even though those were the commandments that are, uh, or, that are in the Bible, that are in the Torah. We were ignorant. So, It says here, then he took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do. So this is when Moses was receiving the oracles. It says, and we will be obedient. This is what the people were agreeing to do. They were going to get the word of God. They were going to hear the word of God. They were going to do the word of God. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all of these words. Pretty, yeah, I think you'll remember that day. And it says on, it says the next, says, now the, all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood afar off. Then they said to Moses, you speak with us. They were so afraid. The Lord showed up and said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to make an entrance. And he did. And the people were so afraid, they said, Moses, Moshe, you talk with us, and we will, we will listen. But this God, if he, if he speaks again, we'll, we'll surely die. But whatever he says, we will do. And we know from history that that's not the case. He did not, I mean, God's people did not obey. We have a tendency of coming off the tracks. We start off really good, and then, yeah. You know, in the garden, we're doing really good. And then, uh, we keep veering off the track. So I was taught in my congregation that uh, the laws changed. That we're not under the ceremonial laws. They started breaking up the laws into moral, moral laws, ceremonial laws, and something else. And I was like, wow, it's still the law. God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
but you're telling me the word changed. But at the same time, and I'm not trying to start nothing, even though they were keep telling me, and this is where I was having a, I was having a little episode in my mind. They were saying we're not under the law, but they didn't have a problem taking up the offering, which is under the law. Yeah? And we would always have a sermonette about, you know, you will not cheat the Lord. You will not rob him, according to Malachi. You're going to give this money. And I'm like, but that's the law, isn't it? So it says, just as God himself does not change, so the Torah, which is his eternal testimony to Israel, cannot be changed. Moshe said, thus said, you shall not add to the word which I command you, nor shall you subtract from it. You must keep the commandments of God, your God, your Lord, your Adonai, which I command you. Therefore, no commandment of the Torah can ever be abrogated or changed. Pretty, pretty straightforward. That's in Deuteronomy. You shall not add or take away from the word of God. So when, when Yeshua came 2,000 years ago, the Pharisees, the, the elders, the rabbis, they, they built fences around the word of God. And they added little things to the word of God. And so the Messiah, he would always say this. I don't know if you've seen this. Yeshua, his, 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 his repeated formula was, you have heard that it was said, but I say to you. He was always straightening out. Because we had gone astray. We had gone off the tracks. We had gone down this rabbit hole. And so he's saying, no, no, I know that this is what was said. Our oral tradition says this, but I say to you, and he's straightening us out. He's setting the record straight. That's all through the scriptures. And I, I've, I've given you a number of scriptures there that will have that saying of the Lord. That's why he's saying that. Because they had gone astray. They had gotten away from their original intent of the Torah. I just finished reading a book called The Final Shofar, and it says, as we approach the end of the age, it is imperative to know the truth and then to walk in it. I'm going to say that one more time. It's imperative to know the truth, but not just to hear it, but to do it, to walk in the truth. While a perfect and precise timeline would be desirous, and we all want to know what, what calendar we're going to use, in the end, it makes no difference if you know when things will happen if you are not in a covenant relationship with yod heh vav -Heh. That's kind of important. That's more important than having the right time, the right calendar. Shamuel says, does Adonai take as much pleasure in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying what Adonai says? Surely obeying is better than sacrifice and heeding orders than the feet than the fat of <laughs> than the fat of rams. The temple service was intended to point us to the need for an atoning sacrifice and the Messiah. That's what the purpose of that was. Yore Bobby does not delight in the system of sacrifice. He was teaching the importance of obedience. You know, when we, when we sing the Shema, Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echa, so when we're singing that, we're saying, hear and obey. Hear and obey. That's what we sh our walk should be. We're going to hear the word of God, and that's why Abraham was chosen, I believe, because he heard the voice of God and he obeyed. The Lord said, get up from there and go to a place where I'm going to show you, and he did. He obeyed. I think our lives are going to depend on whether we do the same thing, whether we listen to the word of God and obey. I, I love this, and I'm going to end this real quick. Here is my servant whom I support, my chosen one, in whom I take pleasure. I have put my spirit on him. He will bring justice to the goyim. That should be, I brought this in there because you need to know this. You people, if you're not from the tribe of Yehuda, you're probably of the Goyim. I mean, you might be from a different tribe, but you might be from the nations. I know I am. And yet he will bring justice. It says the Messiah will bring justice to the Goyim, to us. He will not cry or shout. No one will hear his voice in the streets. He will not snap off a broken reed or snuff out a smoldering wick. He will bring forth justice according to the truth. He will not weaken or be crushed until he has established justice on the earth and the coastlands wait for his Torah. 
at the end, it says, it says, I, Adonai, called you righteously. I took hold of you by the hand. I shaped you and made you a covenant. Made you a covenant for the people to be a light for the goyim, for the nations. I'm going to ask you to grab a microphone, young lady. Grab a microphone. Can I bring you up later? Can I do that? Yeah. Would you give Melissa a microphone, please? Um, it says, so that you can open blind eyes, free the prisoners from confinement, those living in darkness from the dungeon. I am Adonai. That is my name. I, that would not be his name. <laughs> That's one of those translations. I yield my glory to no one else, nor my praise to any idol. See how the former predictions come true, and now new things do I declare before they sprout. I tell you about them. That's reminiscent of the scripture where he said that declaring the end from the beginning. It's the same thing here. That's why he's God. He can do that. And I put this up here in Acts. This is an act. This is in what we call the New Testament. It said, this man led them out, speaking of Moshe, performing miracles and signs in Egypt at the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. This is the Moshe who said to the people of Israel, God will raise up a prophet like me from amongst your brothers. This is the man who was in the assembly in the wilderness. This is the law of first mention. The first time the assembly is mentioned in Scripture. The church, the call, is right here. And it's not in Acts. It's referring to back when the children of Israel came out of Egypt. That was the called out assembly. It says it in the Scriptures. That is the first instance that God has assembled his people called the church. But when I grew up, I was told that the church started in 30 A.D. at Pentecost. Is that... Yeah? Can I get an amen on that? Yeah, but that's not when the church started. That is not when the kahal, the called out assembly, was established. The first mention of it was back in Exodus. Uh, oh, I put this in for a reason. Okay, so in the beginning, God was teaching Adam and Chava, the Torah, in the garden. When he comes back, now he, you know, 2,000 years ago, he, he came and he taught us Torah. Well, this is the future now. I got the beginning, the middle, here's the future. In the Akharet, Yahayamin, the mountain of, the, of Adonai's house will be established as the most important mountain. It will be regarded more highly than any other hill. And all the Goyim will stream there. Ugh. All the nations are going to stream to God's mountain. Many peoples will go and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of Adonai, to the house of the God of Jacob, Yaakov. He will teach us about his ways. So again, we may be at odds with what we believe is true, what we believe about the scripture, or what we believe how to understand the scripture. But there is coming a time when the Messiah comes, he is going to teach us. If we can wait long enough, we can just get along. He's going to teach us his Torah. And we will walk in his path for out of Zion will go forth Torah. The word of Adonai from Jerusalem. Pretty straightforward. In the future, we're going to be taught during that millennial period, for example, we're going to be taught Torah by the, the writer of the Torah. And just so you understand this, Torah refers to the initial five books of Moses. I want to end with this, because I'm, I'm going to bring my daughter up here. I want her to say a couple of things. Because we, we, we have these great discussions, and I, I don't, I don't want to misquote her, so I'm going to ask her to just say what she says. Because she said it better than I did. But I want to show you something. Messiah was in the beginning. He's all through the Tanakh. And he's, you know, when you read the book of Revelation, he's there also. He's, he, the whole scriptures, you look, you look through the scriptures for, for life, for salvation, and you, what you're going to find is Messiah. Let me show you this. This is something that you know, you should know. This, these, these are called the inverted noons. 
Everybody familiar with the inverted nooms? Yes. yes? All right. So when the ark moved, this is where it's found in Numbers 10, 35, 36. This is probably, if you ask a rabbi, this is one of the most important scriptures in all the Bible. It doesn't look like much, but contained in these two sentences, in these two paragraphs, is this revelation. And it says, when the ark moved forward, Moshe said, Arise, Adonai, may your enemies be scattered, let those who hate you flee before you. When it stopped, he said, Return, O Adonai, of the many, many thousands of Israel. This right here is an inverted noon. Right there is another one. These two inverted noons speak of one thing. It speaks of life, okay? This speaks of life. This is a, a, a Hebrew letter that, that's speaking of life. Well, when you have an inverted noon, it's not just life, but it's life from death. This is, this is where you first see this concept of a resurrection in the scriptures. This is speaking about Messiah. When you go to a Jewish synagogue or Messianic synagogue that has a Torah scroll, they will say this when they're bringing out the Torah. They'll say, rise up. And when you put it, when you put it back in its housing, Tabernacle. yes, you, you, you say the rest of that. When it stopped, he said, return Adonai to the many, many thousands of Israel. So it, it's even built into the synagogue liturgy. But this is speaking about the resurrection. This is speaking about one individual, which is the Messiah. Let me give you another one that you may not know. Where's Elijah? Is he in here? He's not there. Are you over there? Are you asleep? Okay, you. The reason why I'm picking on you is because your name is Elijah. Well, this might interest you. Here's another little nugget, because a lot of times in the Messianic movement, we're always looking for something. Teach me something that I've never heard before. Give me something fresh. And I can't do that every time. I can't do that for you. Uh, <laughs> however, the Spirit can open your eyes about things and, and, and open your revelation. But here's one that you may not have heard. Elijah and Elisha, these are two prophets that were called to the... Uh, to Yehuda, it says, Elijah and Elisha really must be looked at together since Elisha followed Elijah and actually wore the mantle. Elisha wore the mantle of Elijah. He also walked in a double anointing. When you examine their Hebrew names, you see an incredible mystery. This is where the Hebrew is so important. We just see things in, in the English and we miss so many things. We talked about the et, the aleph, and the tav, right? Well, this is another one. Elijah, Elijah is Hebrew for Eliyahu. That's your name, Eliyahu, which means my L is yod heh vav -Heh. Elisha means my L is salvation. When these two names are combined, we see that the Eli is what connects the two. Can you see this? I know it's... So you got the Eli and, and Eliyahu. And Elisha, Elisha, Elusha, Eliyu, Eliyahu. When you take the L's off, you have a name. When you remove the Eli, when you remove the Eli from each and combine them, you have Yahushua. Or you can say Yeshua, Yahushua. So these two combine, and these two gentlemen. They, they, they did incredible um, healing, called down fire. They were controlling the elements. These guys were bringing it. They were moving in an anointing that we haven't seen in other prophets. But, but, but these two men's lives, they're, they're speaking about the Messiah. So the mystery of these two miracle-working prophets is Eli Yahushua. My El is Yahushua. Yahushua, of course, is the name of Messiah. You can say Yeshua, Yeshua. And I'm going to end with this because I can keep going, but I'm gonna, I want to give Melissa a chance to say something. Yahushua was doing battle in the garden. It was in the garden that Adam broke covenant with God. And because of the sin of one man, 
all of humanity has been paying the penalty. So we see Yahushua was doing battle in the garden immediately prior to his execution in order to restore what Adam had lost in the garden, Eden, Edan. Through his obedience, death and resurrection, many will be made righteous. Once cleansed and made righteous by his blood, we are then supposed to guard the commandments, and our obedience is our expression of love. Messiah said, if you love me, keep my commandments. Pretty straightforward. We're supposed to be the church. We're supposed to be the called out assembly. We're supposed to love. And I, I'm pretty sure if I took a survey of all of you that are here, I, I could probably guess that many of you have been hurt by the church. That'd be a pretty, pretty accurate guess. Many of you experienced pain. Many of you have been mistreated. But that is not what the church is supposed to be. It's supposed to be a place where you find love, you find acceptance, you find unity. One of my favorite psalms is Psalm 133. How good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. And this is what the church is supposed to be. And I'm telling you what, it's, it's like a marriage. Because um, if you don't work at marriage, it doesn't prosper. You have to, you have to be able to be willing to um, work at it, to sacrifice, to, to love. And if you, you know, many times we're looking for churches, we're looking for a place to, to feel at home. But I, many of these places don't exist. You have to make them. You have to make it what you, what you desire. If you want it to be a loving place, you have to be loving. If you want it to be a sharing place, you have to share. If you want it to be a place where you feel like you're a part of a family, you have to be family. Listen, you want to come up? This is my, this is my uh, eldest. I have a lot of children. This is my eldest. That is my youngest. Uh, <laughs> uh, no, no, you can't sit down. So Melissa um, has never done this before, and I, 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 I uh, we we had a couple of of uh, nights where we just stayed up pretty late and just talking about the Lord. And um, I wish I could have taped some of those sessions because it was some wonderful. What are you doing? Nobody's going to see her if she sits down. Okay. Spoken like a mother. Going to protect her. Um, so the reason I brought her up is because, um, as I said, uh, when I first came here, um, I was looking for a place to call home. Um, and being a pastor... Every time I changed jobs, my family had to change jobs. I think, would you believe, or would you agree, part of the reason why your mother, my wife, is not here with us is because, and she's told me this, she's just got tired of moving. She got tired of, of changing spiritual families. And I'm hoping one day you'll see her here. She's been here a couple of times, but I'm, I'm hoping that, you know, she finds this place to be home. Um... I have a question for you. Okay, I know where I'm going to start. So. You do? Yeah. Oh. You want to start then? Sure. Okay, you go for it. Okay. So I just... You've got to turn it on, yeah. 
Okay. So I decided to start. Um, I am a storyteller and I'm a story keeper. I am a therapist by trade right now and I became a therapist because I wanted to sit with people in their pain. And I wanted to look and empathize and ask how I could come alongside and support them. And the reason why I made a change was because in 2020, I saw a lot of hurt and pain in the United States. And it was a very focalized pain that I, like something like lit in me. And I was like, oh man, we can be doing more as a nation. We can be doing more as a people, as a church. How can I get plugged in? How, what can I do? What can I mobilize and, and impact in a really positive way? And so my family and I, we figured it out as we went. And in that passion, in that willingness and um, cry out to Yahweh to say, what can I do in this part of Fort Wayne, in this part of the world? What can I do to make a change? To say what we have currently is not good enough. And we can and peacefully ask for and demand changes in small ways and in large ways. ways. And I made a lot of mistakes in 2020. And my willingness to want to step out and speak for the most vulnerable, to speak for the most marginalized, I didn't always do it well. And I let my pride become more important than what my calling was in that moment. And so I would get on Instagram and I would get on Facebook and I'd be like, look, this is what we're faced with. What can we do? And if anyone didn't agree with me, they were not my people in that moment. If anyone didn't fall in and say, yes, I see the pain, how can I get plugged in? Then they became my enemy. They were someone else that I had to convince and I had to come, you know, and if, if they didn't fall in, if they didn't say, yes, I see, I, you don't have to convince me, the pain is real and it is evident and how can I be a part of the change? Then you were no longer my people. And I made mistake after mistake because I allowed my words to be more important than the mission. Does that make sense? Like I allowed what I heard and the words spoken back to me to become more important than the humanity and the person sitting across from me. I no longer saw the Yahweh in them. All I saw was something that was not of what I believe to be of the Father. And my insight became more important than the Torah that I was trying to walk out. And so in 2020, my dad and I didn't even speak for months because I was like, look, we got to do this. And what can, you know, how do you want to fall in? And he was like, I, I don't know if I want to. I don't know if I even agree with what you're doing. And I was like, what? No, not you. No, 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 no. And I was so heartbroken that I was like, okay, well, then you're not my, you're not my people either then. You're going to say I'm not your dad. Oh, no, no, no you're always my dad. Oh, I can't wait, change wait, that. What? <laughs> <laughs> no, there's no change in that. Um, and so I, I walked away from relationship while trying to build relationship. And like looking back, it doesn't make any sense. It doesn't make any sense, but in the moment it felt so right. It felt so right to walk away from relationships from people that were like, I'm really comfortable in my life and I don't want to look at the pain in someone else's. And it just, it floored me. I thought, how, how can this be? How can we be the church, but be unwilling to get our hands dirty? to be unwilling to sit with someone, to be the person that walks by the Samaritan in the road and keep going. It didn't make any sense to me, but it didn't have to, right? It didn't have to make sense to me because no matter what anyone else said or did to me, they were still my brother and sister. And I lost sight of that. I lost sight of that. And so I made a career change. I did all these things and I'm still like, I'm still so hungry for what it was all for. What was 2020 all for? Like it was this transformation, but it just felt like so much more pain than growth and joy and resiliency. And I was like, what was it all for? And so that's what led my dad and I to have conversation after conversation because Yahweh just keeps downloading and pouring into me what it means to love Yahweh and love my neighbor. And man, if my legacy can be that I loved you well, if my legacy can be that when you were with me, you felt seen and validated and affirmed, then I have done what I was put on earth to do. And I keep, I keep asking Yahweh, what does that mean? When you were questioned and you narrowed everything down to those two things, what does it mean for me to love my neighbor as myself? What does it mean for me to look across the aisle and join hands with you 
and say no matter what your life looks like, no matter what choices you've made, no matter what choices I've made, do you feel loved when you're with me? And I just keep coming back to it's tangible. It's not just me saying it. It's not me singing it in, in church on Shabbat. It's tangible actions that we take each and every day. And it's not that I'm better than you or I have it more, more made or like I'm this elevated status. No, 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 no. I am just as broken as you are. And in our brokenness, how can we still serve Yahweh together? Even if you don't even know that you're serving Yahweh. The Ruach HaKadosh is in you just like it was breathed into me. So what does that mean? And so dad and I, we just, we keep talking and I'll say something. He's like, oh, that feels a little uncomfortable. And I'm like, that's okay. It's okay to be uncomfortable. It's okay because that's part of the growth process. And so when I talk about what it means to love our neighbor, that's where, that's where we found ourselves. So, so what was your question? What does it mean? What is, what is, what is the greatest command that you you, you, were, you were emphasized that in our conversation? You said there was one thing that we need to do and do it well. Wait, what did I say? <laughs> <laughs> say it again. <laughs> I thought you were going somewhere else. There were two and things, were... and then you said the most important thing that we need to do as a church. Is to love. Yeah, is to love. You want to elaborate on that? Yeah, and um, when we were talking, all of a sudden I remembered because it's scary to love. Because, okay, so this is, this is what ends up happening a lot of times. And if it doesn't resonate with you, that's okay, because it probably resonates with someone next to you. I have this vision right of this table and i keep asking joe to make me this table and i want it to be super long like a like a real life wooden table right and i just see it's it's diversity it's different languages it's different religions and we're all sitting at this table in my backyard and there's different walks of life and there's different beliefs there and i'm like man oh man why don't we do this more and it's fear because if I'm out with so-and-so and someone sees us out together, what are they going to think of me? Do they think that I accept this lifestyle? Do they think that I accept that they're eating this or they're saying this or they're doing that? It's this fear of association, right? Like, I, I don't want to be tainted by being seen or associated with this other group or, you know, whatever it is. And so we put up these walls and I'm like, so what, what casts out fear? Perfect love. Perfect love casts out fear. And if I'm more concerned about what my image is, if I'm more concerned about what people are going to think of me than I am about cultivating this relationship that maybe Yahweh has placed me on this earth to cultivate, then how sad for me for that missed opportunity. Because Yahweh's going to use someone else. It's not just about me. He's going to use someone else. But guess what? Maybe that person has something to speak into my life too. That they were placed on this earth to speak into. That only... If I'm in my obedience, if my obedience is greater than my pride or my belief in my self-importance, what can we be cultivating? And it's love. It all comes back to love. Like, I can be this amazing, Hebraic, you know, messianic woman, but if I have not love, then I'm nothing. I'm nothing. And I keep, we keep missing it, and we keep making it, like, more complicated than it needs to be. What if it's just looking someone in the eye and, and listening to their story or a part of their story? And you don't have to prove it to me. You don't have to prove your pain or your, what you've gone through or what you've done. If you've been hurt, I don't need to ask, well, what were you wearing? What did you say? How were you look? I, those aren't validating questions. And you have to then prove yourself in that moment with me instead of me accepting and loving you for the brother or sister of Christ that you are to me. I don't always have to understand to still be loving. You can ask my friends. I'm constantly asking questions. Like, I'm not in the sacred namers, but I want to know so that I can support when I'm talking to you in my language. Even if I, Salome, how many times have I asked you a question? I'm like, okay, wait, I still don't remember. But I love everyone that I'm with, and I want my language to reflect that. I get, I get, I get made fun of a lot because I'm politically correct, or I try to be. But I'm like, but what if it's just saying to the other person, what do you want to be called? How can I support you in my language when we're together? What does it really cost me to be a little bit more intentional when I'm spending time with you in the language that I use? 
if you will know, if, if, if I am known by his name, then how can I be speaking that when I'm with whoever it is that's sitting across from me? It costs me nothing to be understanding. Okay, what was your next question? I don't know now. <laughs> uh, I'm kind of convicted about some stuff right now, so. Well, and can I just say one more thing too? I love that you started at Genesis because when I was thinking about where I was going to start today, where I was going to start, um, when I was sitting here, Yahweh was said, just tell a part of your story. Because what is the Bible but a compilation of our stories? What connects us, what, what makes us keep going back is that I see a part of my story in this story. I see a part of me in this person over here. And they lived a life that I will never get to live, but man, I'm so grateful that I got to know that part of their story that I got to see them make mistake after mistake after mistake, and Yahweh still said, but I have a calling for you. I want you to cross over. How can I cross over in my life with whoever it is that I'm sharing space with? How can I cross over? And so when you started with Genesis today, it was perfect because that was something that Yahweh laid on my heart last night. Because why was Israel instituted? to be a light to the nations. Are you being a light to the nations? How can, maybe the question can be Yahweh, how can I be a light to the nations? You have called me so that I can call others. In what more beautiful way can we do that through our actions? Not through our words. Words are forgotten. It's how you made someone feel. It's what you did, it's you fed them. You clothed them. You visited them in prison. You did what you could to be as hospitable as you could when you were with that individual. So if the Bible didn't start with Israel, it started with all humanity. And then we were so important that Yahweh said, I'm going to call these, these, these people, these very ordinary people that are going to make a lot of mistakes and they're going to get it wrong a lot of times but the nations are worth pursuing enough that I'm going to have a calling so that all people will come to me. Not those that I agree with, <laughs> not those who look like me or talk like me or maybe live in the same neighborhood as me. I don't choose who my neighbor is. I don't choose who Yahweh has placed in my life for a reason. That maybe make me feel a little uncomfortable or I think, oh, I don't know, maybe they think that I agree with their lifestyle. Let your actions speak louder than your words. You continue to live the Torah. You continue to be the living, breathing Torah to them. And the Yahweh that convicts you, let him convict them as well. If I trust him enough to speak to me, why can't I trust him enough to speak to you? So... If Abraham, if he was meant to be the father and to be the light into the nations, and we call ourselves Israel, we believe that we are part of that, then how can you, in your ordinary, beautiful lives, how can you be that light to those around you? How can you find opportunities, maybe that don't even exist in your life, but Yahweh's just been waiting for that spark for you to ask, how can I be a light to, the, to those around me? Thank you, Melissa. Um, so I have a question, and then I'm going to turn it over to Brian. What kind of assembly do you want to be a part of? Do you want to be a part of a loving congregation? Then you have to be loving. Do you want to be a part of a congregation that uh, accepts you? Then you have to be accepting. Do you want to be a part of a congregation that is, is hungry and, and wants more of Yahweh and, and is pursuing him with all of their strength? then you have to pursue as well. 
And I want to be a part of something like that. I don't want to be a part of this, you know, most churches when they start, the aim is to, you know, build numbers. And I've been on that, on that road before and um, ended up places I've been, they were a mile wide and an inch deep. It wasn't what I thought it was going to be. I'd rather be around people like, when I think about Gideon's army, you know, uh, God, you know, God told Gideon, you're going to go do some battle. And Gideon went and did what he's supposed to do. He, he got some people, and God said, no, that's too many. A little less. He drops them off, and no, a little less, a little less. And I, myself, I'd rather be around some people that love Yahweh, that love well, that can do life with me well, than, than to have this place packed out. That's not my heart. I'd rather, um, when Peggy says, I need some wood, that um, she has too much wood, <laughs> you know. <laughs> you know, when, um, when, when somebody texts me and says, hey, can you pray for my wife? I'm not just going to say it. I'm doing it, you know. Um, when uh, not one of us, there should not be anybody in this congregation, I'll, and I'll end with this, there should not be anybody in this congregation that's in need. You hear what I'm saying? The, if we are a New Testament, that model, there should not be anybody in this congregation that's in need. When I say need, I'm talking about not want, but need. If you need food, there should not be anybody in this congregation that's needing food. If, if whatever the situation is, um, I want to be a part of that kind of church that kind of assembly where I know you've got my back and, and I've got yours. And in and, and your time of need, in my time of need, you'll be there and I promise to be there for you. That's what I want to be a part of. But it just doesn't happen by itself. We have to be intentional. We have to be very intentional. And it's going to cost us something. But the uh, rewards are great. The re rewards are worth it. You want to say something else? Yes. Um, I just wanted to encourage you that in the Torah, the command to treat the alien fairly comes up 52 times. So it is no small thing to treat those around you as you yourself want to be treated. Um, and then I just wanted to end with a poem um, to speak words of life. You were created to do good work, work that empowers and inspires, liberates and transforms, restores and softens. Yes, work can be hard as it was meant to be. The verb itself calls us into action rejecting passivity and demanding sustained effort. It provokes, activates, and disturbs. But this work, this calling for justice, it is good work. It defends the oppressed and frees the captive. It tears down walls and destroys barriers. It changes things. So when you're feeling weary or hopeless or spent, remind yourself that the darkness is being flooded by miraculous light. Yes, this is work, and it is good. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Stand to receive the blessing. And this blessing is found in number six. Verses 22 through 27, it is referred to um, commonly as the Aaronic Blessing. 
And it says, Then the Lord spoke to Moshe, saying, Speak to Aharon and to his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the sons of Israel. You shall say to them, Yevareka Yahweh Vish Mareka Yahweh Yahweh Nabalecha Vichumneka Isa Yahweh, Panahav Lecha, Veyasem Lecha, Lecha Shalom. Then in English, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his shalom. B'shem Yeshua HaMashiach, Shahar Shalom Hu Adonai, in the name of Yeshua, the Prince of Peace, you are Lord. And all of Yahweh's people said, Amen. So listen, um, in case you didn't know, it's what we do around here. We have something, we have a fellowship meal, it's called Oneg. Um, it's being heated or cooked right now. So just give us about 15 minutes and I'm going to ask you to come and uh, you don't have to have brought any food. The Lord always provides, so please come and fellowship. And if you have any questions about today's teaching, you can talk to me then.